Yo, 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 Thought Warriors. What is up? High Learning is on. It is I, Van Lathan Jr. And it's me, Rachel Lynn Lindsay. $10 rum punch buckets at Applebee's. What? You heard what the hell I said. <laughs> you I'm what? talking to everybody right now in the Los Angeles area. I learned something amazing. What I learned today was that Applebee's, this is not an ad, <laughs> Applebee's has buckets of rum punch for $10. $10, $10, $10 bucket of rum punch, okay? So guess what I'm going to do? What? This Saturday, Uh-oh. I'm going to be at the Applebee's in Chatworth. You're going to drive right? that far away? That's like, put it's that in perspective for people who don't live here. You're not just going around his, the corner. <laughs> it's hysterical that you think that's far. That is far. And it's closer to me than it is to you. Phil's gym is in Woodland Hills. Basically, Calabasas. I'm out there in the 81 Izzy almost every single day. That doesn't mean I'm it's not Mr. far. I'm Mr. 818. It just means you're I'm, used to you it. Don't, it's still do far. you know how Pitbull is Mr. 305? No. You can call me Mr. 818 but if we you want it. I, when, I first, when I first got to LA, it was Van Nuys is where I was. That's where I was when I first got to LA. You don't even know. Like, check it's me down out. Down the street from Woodland me. Hills. Check me out. Silmar. Check me out. Chatsworth. But all up and down Sherman Way. That's where I'm. You don't even know, man. Granada. Guys, all of that. Man, shout out to the a, Valley, bro. That's a, I love Pacoima. the Valley. Shout out to the Valley. Ask, shout out to the Valley, guys. That's about an hour away from Van. So it's just to put that's it in. That's not a, an hour away. In. No, it's not oh, an hour. Unless you leave at 10 o'clock at night, it's an hour away. It's not an hour. It's an hour. She's not, so he's not so true. This is how far he's driving for the rum bucket or whatever it was called. Whoa. Whoa. whoa, whoa. Hold on for a second. <laughs> okay. Just be careful. You're a letter away from that being like, okay. Whoa. Okay. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's okay. It's a bucket of rum punch. No. All right, yo, you said like you said I'm driving an hour for a rum bucket. Okay, it's a bucket of rum punch. It's a whoa. All right, just like calm it down. We'll reel it all the way in, right? So yeah. have you had um, it, or you just heard no, about it but, and you're chasing but, it? So here's the deal: every every single way that you say this makes it seem untoward. Like I'm chasing. You know? Van, you were driving far to go after. It's I mean, like not that far. Most what people, most people don't get up and go for this kind of stuff unless it is the things that you were that I you said I was one letter away from. <laughs> see, you see, see, you don't know how me and Kalika have gotten down. Do you remember the day? Do you remember the game? And anybody can jump in. Remember the game where uh, Steph Curry hit like the 30 foot three to beat uh, your, your ex boyfriend and them um, uh, back in like 2016? Remember? Remember the day? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just tried to slide like that, that huh? in there. What about um, it? What about it? Uh, so we had decided that day that we were going to find. It wasn't an Applebee's. I think it was like a TGI Fridays. Uh, Why? Or something. Be because they advertised this like all you can eat apps thing. And so we were just like, hey, we're going to go get some apps. Some all you can eat apps. And so we went and got some of the apps. And I think we found it. I think it was TGI Fridays or it was one of those. But I, we found one in Southgate, which is I don't even know that is. not far and culturally much different from Hollywood. Um, shout out to Southgate. Shout out to my people in Southgate. We was out there at Southgate. What I'm saying, it's not it's not about the drive. It's about the actual happening. And I'm telling you right now, if you live in the LA area, Saturday is Rum Punch Day at Applebee's Chatsworth. Okay? I don't care what Rachel says. 
I go to the islands, and when I go to the islands, nothing makes me feel better. Nothing makes me feel better than throwing back a rum punch. I love it. But when I come back here, I can't really find a rum punch like that. Yeah. So I saw buckets of rum punch. <laughs> it's going to be so- Saturday. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to work out. And about 2.30 or 3 o'clock, I'm going to be gulping down some buckets of rum punch at the Applebee's. And everybody's invited. This is not an ad. If you come out there, 10 bucks, I'll buy you a bucket of rum punch and you can drink with me. How I'm going to be there. How are you care. getting home? Rachel, um, it, it, the, there's a, something called Uber. Rachel, you will come there too. You will come there and have- I'm busy. Rachel, Rachel, are you in town on Saturday? I'm busy. Are you in town on Saturday? I'm busy. Rachel, I need you to commit. I need you to commit to at least one bucket of rum punch. If okay. you get Brian I need you to-, to drink the rum, look, even my dogs don't like it. My dogs are upset by it. They don't want me to have the rum punch. If you get Brian to say yes to the rum punch, when does Miami does Miami play on Saturday? Oh, I think they do. Let me look at the schedule. Let me look at the schedule. I think they do. They won a game. Okay, they got their home split. Let me look at the final schedule real quick. Like, uh, I think they do. Hold on, let me look. Uh, oh no, it's on Friday. Oh, uh, mm. if I go, if I go to Rum Punch with you on Saturday, will you come to Everyday People with me on Sunday? Yep. Hell yeah. What? Absolutely. I'll definitely go. I'll, I'll make it a Rum Punch double header. Great. Well, like we'll go. I'll 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 come to Everyday People and do some Rum Punch. Will you going with Nina Parker? Is that who's going? Nina's out of town. But I've never been to everyday people. So I got a table. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. I'll go there. Can I invite Sarunis? Who? Sarunis Jackson. Who's that? He's a friend of mine. He's an actor. And he was on the Insecure show. Sarunis is six foot seven. Oh. He's a tall <laughs> What's dude. his name on the show? Light skinned <laughs> dude. Yeah, yeah. Don't act like you don't know who he is. All the women of LA have, have I did his not, picture on there. I did they, All the women of LA. Saru, let me tell you about Sarunis. Sarunis is Sarunis is the number one. He was for many years ranked number one sexy nigga of LA. Everybody was like, <laughs> oh my God, he's so tall. Like people would come up to me. I hadn't seen him in a while. I'd be with him. Like, man, how you doing? I'm like, hey, how you doing? He's like, man, can you introduce me? Come here, Sarunis. Kiss her on the face. Oh my god! With consent. Um, but no. So he goes to he goes to and he goes to everyday people, uh, and so yeah, he'll come over to our table, and then you know that he'll was, be around there, and he'll now. start glowing like Prince and the whole night. Yes, yeah, our table. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, we'll look, do it. so if I'm I rum something. punch with you, you have to come. I don't want you to have a That's hangover from too much rum punch. No. I live by it. We can come no. here and we'll go rum punch. Brian will just be the designated driver because he's not going to drink it. Guess what we are this weekend in them streets? All right, rum punch on streets. Saturday, and, and, and guess what? Everybody can come to everyday people yeah, and rum punch. Hang with All us. the thought warriors. Sunday, come hang with us. Sunday is a double header. Sunday, everyday people. <laughs> Saturday, rum punch. Okay, this weekend's gonna be epic. Uh, was last weekend epic for you? What'd you do? No, I was. Chill. Oh gosh, what did I do this weekend? I feel like I was chilling. The weather was good, so. We were outside by the pool. My girlfriend Jade came over with her son. We watched the game, got stuff done. Um, I went to a wonderful event um, that Natty, Natty, Nat, Natalie Manuel Lee puts was a moderator from. It was a wonderful conversation with Kendrick Sampson, Ilyan Omar. Um, it was, it was really great. It was about like radical vision and joy and arts. And it was a beautiful space. And I listened to great poetry and great music and great conversation. So I did that on Saturday. But the rest of it, I was chilling. I was chilling. What about you? You you were still in Louisiana. You just got back. I was in Louisiana. Got back, got back last night. Uh, trip took a lot out of me. Okay. Um, 
I forgot about there's something that goes on in Louisiana, mm-hmm. uh, in Baton Rouge. I called it the cold hot paradox. Okay. Okay. So I used to get a lot of headaches in Louisiana because of the cold hot paradox. And what it is is that it's so hot outside that everybody blasts their air conditioner. That's true. So whenever you're inside of a building in Baton Rouge, it's freezing. Mm-hmm. Right now in LA, sometimes you don't even have to run your air conditioner uh, during the day. And I turn it on on a at night. At night we're gonna get chilly. Okay, at night I gotta feel burn. I hate that. It's cold in here. There must be some <laughs> uh, <laughs> some sleeping in the atmosphere. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but during the day it's like whatever. It's 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 temperate. You know, we live in a temperate climate. But back at home, you know. You go places and you have to, because as soon as you turn the air off, even in the car, you're like, now nah, I'm too hot. Then you turn the air on, you're like, now nah, I'm too cold, mm-hmm. and especially now. So I had a headache for a lot of the time that I was oh. home. And I also, I also, I worked out every day. Great. But also, I, I, I ate once a day, but I made that one meal count. I'm not going to lie. I'm not, gonna, <laughs> I'm not playing with y'all. Well, it would be but upsetting if you house, went there and didn't have the food. I got. I went to my grandmother's house Sunday, and uh, my mamo. I love you, mamo. Love you, mom. Love you, Ebony. Got to see everybody. I bought my my little brother a PlayStation Five. I handed out cash money to my nieces and nephews, just hitting them with just just being an uncle, being an uncle, right? Um, I will talk about my little brother in a second, but uh, I, I go. I get to my grandmother's house Sunday. And, you know, it's the day that we're about to leave and, and come back, and you know. I was, I'm always ready to get back to LA whenever I whenever I leave any place. I'm like, it's time to go home. Okay, I'm time to get back to LA. My grandmother goes, Hey Van, would you, you know, maybe like, I don't know, it's like 12 noon. I say, Van, you you want something to eat? I like, yeah. And she comes back with a bowl full of ice cream and cake. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they had made <laughs> they had made a seven up cake. Oh. And uh, yes, they had made a seven up cake and I'll, and she goes into a bluebell ice cream and I just sit there and I eat and I just, it, if, if it was a movie scene, it wouldn't have been even me eating. You'd have looked over and it'd have been a little fat 11 year old version of me <laughs> with a spoon and my hat and my, my baseball hat on just eating it and everybody. And they, my, my mother and my grandmother and my sister look at me with such unadulterated love. It's they <laughs> like, so I didn't. They weren't aware that, like, I was coming home. They didn't know. Oh, wait, you surprised them. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think you, maybe so you said I, that. I forgot. So I walk into the house, and my grandmother goes, what the fuck? <laughs> and then she just, <laughs> and then she just starts crying. And she cried. Then mom wasn't there yet. And so then mom walks in the room, and I scare her. And she goes, ah, ah. And then, like, we just all loved on each other. And, uh. It was great, and uh, Kalika Kalika is such a, a great travel companion because she absorbs the energy of my mother and my grandmother, and it's a lot of energy, and she just gives it back and plays off. And it's good for her to see Baton Rouge. I took her to South Baton Rouge, across the tracks. We got to see some young men with guns, with ski masks, uh, which was very interesting for Kalika. Yeah, we drove down the river road until we got to Roosevelt. We made a ride on Roosevelt, so it was in the south across the tracks. And we see some young brothers coming out. I'm sure they were coming out to to greet a car and have a good time and they had guns with ski masks on. Yeah, it's Baton Rouge. Come on now. Feel the, catch the feeling. feeling. Baton Rouge. <laughs> Baton Rouge, me. Louisiana. <laughs> One of the ten most dangerous cities in America. <laughs> Jeez. Well, ski masks and guns when it's hot outside. You're talking about people wearing ski masks and shit. Yeah. Yeah, don't act like Dallas is a picnic, nigga. Y'all get it popping out there too. <laughs> like, it's like, like, are we in the top ten? To act like you. Y'all, if, if not, if if Dallas isn't in the top ten, it's only because it's such a big city. Because it's harder for those big cities to really get in the top ten. Like, you would think Chicago would be there. You would think that New York would be in there. You would think, but they're not really because those places have areas where there's like little to no crime. Right. Like, if you got a city between. A uh, half a million 
to 1.5 in terms of the people, that's the sweet spot for the crime to be able to touch every part of the city. Like, hey, you might get fucked up, you know, although Atlanta's huge and it could go down at any point. <laughs> no, seriously. Like <laughs> Atlanta's huge. And they was like, I was like, uh, staying at, I was staying at the wall, the Waldorf in Atlanta. And by the way, I'm not shitting on Atlanta. How is that? Because I'm, I'm, I'm going to be there next week. Literally at that. The, the, yes. The hotel? Yeah. Wiggity, wiggity, whack. Oh, I'm going <laughs> to tell them to change it. <laughs> That's all we go. We move into the same region. That's all I needed like, to hear. Wiggity, wiggity, whack. You know, but I, I'll be honest with you though. It's like there's only a couple cities in America that are good hotel cities. Like, really. LA is a good hotel. LA city. is a good hotel. Vegas is obviously a good hotel. A hotel city. Okay. Vegas is an amazing hotel city. Oh my, what? Okay, Vegas, okay. The, it's the whole, it's part of the, Miami's a great hotel city and New York is a great hotel city. I would say that Chicago is right there too. Other than that, you can get, you can go to hotels like in other places and these hotels, even if they're older, they're, they're not that nice. Like they're, it, it's like they're, they're not super nice. Like even in New Orleans, or different places like that. You go to some of the super oh, nice hotels. Yeah. They're older. Like they're not. They're not like the Ritz in so New the, Orleans. The, it's like what? It's, it's not. The, oh, we sound okay. We got. <laughs> we got, <laughs> we got <laughs> it was. It was. <laughs> that was the final okay, straw. Okay. We said. <laughs> all right, all right, I'm sorry. The point oh, is, that is was, that you don't need to be spending yeah. your money all on these expensive hotels because That's it's really. The point. It's really not worth it. Is what we're trying to say. Right. We're wasting that, our money. Don't do that. That's what I'm trying that. to say. Yes. That's that. Yeah. What you find you it, without, if you're not in one of those places, find you a nice boutique hotel that's chic, that smells good in the lobby and do your thing. Because like, you know, you're at the the, the place in Atlanta and it's, uh, the, the staff is amazing there. I'll say that. The staff is fantastic because it's right there in Buckhead. So the staff, the staff is great. But as far as the hotel, it's like, you know, it's not, but you did, you know, nah, it wasn't that, wasn't that great. And look, I, I really, I'm that, I wasn't trying to be a snob, so I'm sorry. But I've been, I had to travel for my job. I stayed at a lot of hotels, different places. Um, All right, we got to get into the show. <laughs> Nikki Haley, man. We do uh, have to talk about her. You like her. Me too. She's no, one so of no, your no, top no, 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 no. We're not going to continue this narrative. <laughs> Anytime you <laughs> mention a Republican candidate, you start off with saying you like them, you're into them, you're excited about them. I'm not. Definitely mm. not Nikki Haley. Yeah. We don't even like know what Nikki Haley truly um, stands for. She's a flip flopper. But she's talking flip, now. But she's talking now. Go ahead, talk about it. She had a town hall. You watched it. You watched Flippity it. Flop, you enjoyed it. Just like the. Just the, I, I watched it. I watched the whole thing in its entirety. Flippity flop, just like the fish at Tony Seafood on Plank Road. I want to tell <laughs> Baton Rouge how much I love you. I love the chimes. I love Tony Seafood. I love Boiling Rue. I love Government Street. I love LSU. I love Southern. I love Gardia. I love the bottom. I love the top. I love McKinley. I love my hometown. On the other side of this break, we're going to talk about Nikki Haley. We also have an interview with Aaron Morrison of the Associated Press, someone that covers grassroots black organizations and the movement itself, civil rights, all of that. We're going to talk to him about some of the controversies surrounding organizations like Black Lives Matter, Global Network Foundation, and Color of Change to talk about how much of a cuck I'm being for black organizations and, and and what's a way for us to nutritiously criticize places that are supposed to be operating uh, um, on and in our behalf. Aaron Morris is coming later on the other side of this, Nikki Haley. Yeah, before we get to Nikki Haley, I just want to let you know uh, I've, uh, I've signed up for notifications about when Apple's Vision Pro is going on sale. It's the Apple virtual reality. I can't believe it. I can't believe what it looked like. So wait, what What's is happening? what is this? What does it do? I'm not really familiar with VR. It's a world. V. It's a VR. It's a VR rig, so you can look at stuff, and you can be immersed into a different world. You know what I'm saying? Okay, but how is that different from like the Facebook one? 
The I mean, it's Oculus. A Oculus, it's a competitor. So <laughs> I was close. The way it works typically in American capitalism is one person comes out with a product and then <laughs> somebody know. else goes, I'll come out with a better but product. <laughs> I guess I just like, I guess because I'm that world is so foreign to me. I'm like, what do you do? Do you play games in it? Do you walk around in this world and like, you know, I feel like Donnie in, has something to say here. You're in France one day. Oh, I was going to say that it, it, I think it also has AR capabilities, mm, yeah. which is reality. where it like brings things into your real Wait, wait, wait. So like I can have this thing on and I'm sitting in my living room, but, and I see that, but things are happening. I, I don't like it. I'm just, I'm, I don't like it. Donnie, what were you going to say? No, I was just gonna say, yeah, that's exactly it. Like in the trailer I saw, they bring Mickey Mouse into your living room, or if you're I, watching an terrifying. NBA game, you can watch the replay like on your table, like from like a god level angle. It's wild stuff. Yeah, I have one. I have one. They say they say that it's not gonna be cheap, um, but I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna see. I'm gonna see what they have, and I'm gonna have one. You're I'm never coming. You're yeah, never gonna come out of that world. Nah, probably not. <laughs> um, speaking of coming out of the world, Nikki Haley is coming out into the world as a candidate for president. Oh, Jesus Christ. Transition king. Uh, she did a town hall on the brand new Republican News Network. No, it's CNN. Uh, um, no, CNN is covering the Republican challengers for the presidency, and they did... Uh, uh, town hall with Nikki Haley in Iowa. Did you watch this town hall? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it. I thought about it. And then I said, nah. I watched Trump. I just couldn't. Trump. I'm um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I watched it. I watched it. I think as soon I didn't see it when it first aired uh i might have been on a plane when it first aired i saw it when it uh, i saw it on replay this morning i watched it in its entirety and the standout clip or the most controversial clip should i say from the town hall had already been making the rounds when i watched it uh speaking about that clip here it is right here presidential candidate nikki haley what does it mean to you? How do you define woke? There's a lot of things. I mean, you want to start with biological boys playing in girls sports. That's one thing. The fact that we have gender pronoun classes in the military now. I mean, all of these things that are pushing what a small minority want on the majority of Americans, it's too much. It's too much. I mean, the idea that we have biological boys playing in girls sports, it is the women's issue of our time. My daughter ran track in high school. I don't even know how I would have that conversation with her. How are we supposed to get our girls used to the fact that biological boys are in their locker rooms? And then we wonder why a third of our teenage girls seriously contemplated suicide last year? We should be growing strong girls, confident girls. Shit. Uh, Rachel? And this is why I didn't watch. Because... <laughs> I didn't want to be subjected to things like this or anything else that Nikki Haley was going to spew out of her mouth. We talked about how these Republican candidates, we talked about what's going to be on the ballot and the things that they're going to argue. So it's no surprise that Nikki Haley is um, taking the opportunity as soon as she can to talk about trans children, because that's a big talking point or pushing point for the Republican Party. The troubling thing in addition to the whole way that she was talking about, to me, is that she says it's one of the most important women's rights issues of our time. When we're dealing, when we're in a world where Dobbs exists and the fact that they are governing our reproductive rights and telling us what we can do with our body and our uterus, how dare you say that when our young women, us now and young women are gonna grow up in a society where they don't have autonomy over their body. That's the issue if you're talking about women's rights that we need to talk about. Not these made up issues with statistics that aren't, that aren't true. That is not why there's a high level or an increased level of suicide risk amongst teen girls. It's not because they have 
trans children in schools or boys playing um, or biological boys playing uh, women's sports. That's not the issue. They take a small thing and they magnify it. And that's not what it is. If you want to talk about increased level of suicide with young women, let's talk about the society that women live in and the way women are treated in this society, the way that they are supposed to look, the way that they are supposed to be, these unrealistic beauty standards on social media with filters. You know, when we were kids, it was magazines and TV commercials. Now, everywhere you look, you have these unrealistic um, ideas of what beauty is. That's the pressure that's put on young teens. That's what makes them have anxiety and depression and, you know, compare themselves to other people to an unhealthy level where they have issues greater than we did growing up. That's the real issue. So I just have, I, this bothers me so much. One, the way that she captured this, but two, you're lying. That's not it. And so the fact that you're spewing out this misinformation is extremely problematic when there is a real issue of suicide. There is a real issue of growing depression with young kids, but that's not the reason why. And if you really, if you really were serious about it, you would address it in the correct way rather than politicizing it. Yeah. I look, uh, so I, I watched the entire exchange after that, uh, Jake Tapper, uh, comes back and give, gives her some information. Um, there are a group of teens that are uh, facing an epidemic almost of suicide, and that's LGBTQ plus teens. Um, they are three times more likely to contemplate suicide um, than their peers. Uh, six in 10 students in 2021 who had same-sex partners con considered suicide uh, compared with 26% of students that had opposite sex partners. Now, obviously, we're talking about specifically uh, trans Americans right here. Um, but the reality is, according to the, the the data from the Trevor Project, we know that there are uh, a group of kids that are at a heightened um, vulnerability to be suicidal and to harm themselves. And those are the kids that you put on the fringes and outsides of society when you don't let them step into who they are. All mm -hmm. right. Um, there are a couple of things that, that are wrong with the statement. One thing is that it completely dismisses the intense amount, to your point, of societal dysfunction that's gone on for kids in the last three years. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was just around a bunch of teenagers and the teenagers are telling me how sad they are. Mm. And they're telling me how sad they are because they live in a world where their innocence is stripped from them because mm -hmm. of fears of their death um, and because of what COVID did to the social structures um, that that they relied on. You know, at that age, kids are oftentimes mean to each other, but they also need each other to kind of find their way through this crazy thing called maturing and puberty. Yeah. And a lot of them didn't have that. And they were sit, they were forced to sit in rooms and kind of figure it out. Um, and kind of have connection on uh, FaceTime when they didn't really know what connection really was yet, right? Mm -hmm. And it's weighing on a lot of them. And you're seeing that affect black kids particularly in a way because a lot of the places that they come from didn't have the resources to continue to reach out to them while they were in these spots. So our kids are a little mentally strained right now. Yeah. They are a little spiritually strained right now. I'm not going to deny that. Uh, I haven't heard one bit of compelling evidence that what she said has anything to do with it. And before you make uh, an assertion like that on a platform like that, you have damn well been, been able to uh, be able to back it up. Um, things like this to me are disqualifying from not just being the president, from holding any office. Yeah. When you just take such a big issue Think about this. The, think about how breathtaking that was. When you take a big issue like uh, suicide, suicidal ideation in teen girls and you say it's because of trans people. Mm -hmm. like, this is the playbook for American villainization um, and uh, for making one group vulnerable. Your kid wants to kill themselves. 
because of the existence of this person. Like, that to me demonstrates the same level of indoctrination in terms of the pernicious part of identity politics that has existed on the right, that Nikki Haley is subject to that. It's mm-hmm. everyone else. Hey, these people are going to kill you. Remember that, that? And for everyone out there right now, that's us as well. That's always been us. Birth of a Nation, the first motion picture ever made, showed black black men in a light that were going to rape white women, take them, uh, do all kinds of crazy things to them, and whatever. Every single time, hey, these are the people that want to kill you. You have to be hypervigilant against them. And you know what that turns into? That turns into kill them before they kill you. Right. And I just, when I, when I heard her say that, I know she's not the brightest bulb in the entire closet, but when I heard her say that, I thought, like, that's profound. That's profoundly irresponsible, mm-hmm. dangerous, and hateful to say that this one specific thing that's going on is making young girls want to kill themselves. Yeah. It's, it's, and, and for, there are a lot of people out there that are critical of Jake Tapper and the way that he handled this. I will say that if you watch it in its entirety, um, I wouldn't say that he necessarily uh, said, hey, stop, that's not true. That's not what he did. But if you watch it in its entirety, there is a rebuttal after that to where Jay Tapper comes on and he says, hey, well, these are the numbers from the Trevor Project about the uh, the the prevalence of suicide amongst LGBTQ youth. Do you care about those kids? Shouldn't we make a world where those kids feel safe and where those kids don't want to um, harm themselves or, or feel like they're included in society? Yeah. Obviously, Nikki Haley didn't have anything smart to say about that. But there was something on the other end of that. Uh, whether or not it's too tepid for anyone, you can make your own decision to where Jake Tapper did address uh, the children that Nikki Haley made responsible for the suicides of young girls. It's just crazy, like kind of where we are. Uh, it, it really is. It's, 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 it's crazy where we are. Um, also want to say uh, also, ha- happy, Pride Month. happy Pride Month. Happy Pride Month. Happy Pride Month. To the community. Yeah. Yes. Happy pr- yeah. You know what? Come out to Applebee's. <laughs> you know, or everyday or people good, like, on Sunday. Come, we oh, love everyday y'all. People gonna go we nuts. love y'all. Come out to, you know what? Come out to Applebee's. God damn it. Come out. To, you know what? We'll we'll protect you guys. Like we'll 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 be right there with you. Come to the goddamn Applebee's and have a drink. Jesus Christ. I wish there was an Applebee's in West Hollywood now. Yeah, um, because Chatworth is so, so far. Get out of here. <laughs> you know, they don't. You know, they don't really have those types of places inside the L.A. city limits. Yeah. You can't really get them. That's my beef yeah. with L.A. is growing up, you know, <laughs> like a Louisiana and a Texas. I, there aren't drive throughs the way that I want them to where I want them to be. And there aren't those chain restaurants. Now, I'm in the valley and I'm closer to like the Burbank. So I see it. And I'm like, oh, there's a BJ's. I didn't even know those existed here in L.A. There's a Cracker Barrel. I love Cracker Barrel. Say what you want about Cracker Barrel. I love it. I know. Oh, I, we all know you love Cracker Barrel. <laughs> Just guess I set myself up for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, that's my one issue with them. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Move on. Forget it. <laughs> uh, Nikki Haley. Also, there was also a lot of talk. And let me tell you another disgusting part of the the uh, the town, town hall. hall to me. Mm-hmm. So Nikki Haley went on a little Martin Luther King rant. In in what way? And it was about about taking down the Confederate flag from the uh, the flag of of South Carolina from the Capitol. The Confederate oh. flag. You know, I'll tell you, um, we had that horrific shooting in Charleston that killed nine amazing souls, and it happened at a time where it was on the heels of Ferguson. And I was so worried our state was going to fall apart. And the national media came in and they wanted to make it about race. They wanted to make it about um, the death penalty. They wanted to make it about guns. And I strong armed them at the time. And I said, there will be a time and place we can have those debates. But right now we need to put to rest nine amazing souls. And I tried to protect them. She talked about how Dylan Roof walked into uh, the church, prayed with the people. And then we, of course, know uh, committed a heinous, um, despicable 
subhuman crime where he executed nine people. She talked about how that, um, how that moment inspired her to take the flag down because after that, she was asked about whether or not she was going to do it. She was noncommittal. Then she saw a picture of Dylan Roof, um, Dylan Roof, uh, draped in the flag. And she was like, we got to take the flag down. And how she went to everyone and she was, gave this impassioned type of deal about how the flag was able to uh, be removed and whether or not people would support her. She knew she had to do it. She told people if they didn't want to support her, that's cool. But she when she got that done after that happened. You know, Rachel, it, it, I'm watching it. And I'm going into the town hall knowing what she said, essentially blaming suicide on trans youth. So I'm already I'm already knowing that this is a person who uh, is unfit for not just higher office in terms of the, the presidency, but higher office in terms of the governor, because she doesn't know what her words mean. She doesn't realize that by saying that the young girls want to kill themselves because of trans people that they have proximity to, that that endangers those trans people and also puts a battery in the back of people that might want to harm them because they're making those trans people responsible for the death of young girls. It's so disgusting, okay? Mm -hmm. And then when I saw this, I was like, so there's an American orthodoxy that exists that demands the blood of black people for any type of societal change that black people want. Like we have to bleed for it. it, it, it like I, I don't I don't know what white people don't get. It's like, you know, Trump is bad after January 6th. Take the take the flag down off the state house. Uh, after nine black people are murdered and somebody is wrapping themselves in the flag. Mm. You know, civil rights. After black people are getting bit mm -hmm. and killed and lynched and all of that. And I'm like, are y'all fucking dumb? Are you mm, dumb? No, they're not. I, w I wish I could have been hosting the situation because I'd have been like, you mean to tell me that it took Nine fresh bodies, fresh ones, for you to realize that the Confederate flag is a symbol of the death of black people, of black enslavement and torture and rape, that that's what they use it for? So you need fresh bodies. So, so for everything else that's going on, it's not that these things don't mean you just want us to die again. And I'm watching it, and I'm like, yo, she thinks she's spitting up here. And everybody's like, yeah, Nikki, what bravery you showed by taking a fucking Confederate battle flag off the state house in the fucking 2010s. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> it's almost How like, brave. It, it's almost even worse. It adding on to that, because everything you're saying is right, it's almost as if she was waiting for the opportunity where she could politicize it. Yeah, she's like in a state that supports that, but she could make herself a white savior by saying, look what I did when I realized this. It's like, I'm gonna ignore the history and meaning. I'm gonna ignore, ignore the cries of the black community who have constantly been fighting for, to get this down, who've been telling you what this means. It's not until I realize it and I have my white savior moment that it becomes something. And that's what I feel like. I feel like, I, well, one, I'm not gonna give it to her because I'm for all the reasons that you said, but even more so, this is a politicized moment to me. She did that to me to boost her own image. She didn't care. You didn't care before, you don't care now. So this book right here that I'm holding up is called The Thanos, Imp uh, the Thanos Imperative, right? So these are people on the cover of the book, Moon Dragon. You got Thanos, Silver Surfer, the Star Lords down there. It's like That's you're speaking Nova. a different language to me. Rocket Raccoon, this is the book, okay? 
Mm-hmm. All right, this is a book that I like to read. You know, it's very good. Guardians in the book. A lot of people are in it, right? It's a comic book. Um, don't 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 try. No, to I, I'm legit asking a question. I said Thanos is in it, so yeah, it's a comic book. I like the, to read. It. Okay. It, 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 if if I had a problem with you, I wouldn't shove this book in your face. Do you know why? Why? Because. Me shoving this book in your face wouldn't mean anything. You wouldn't know what this book meant. Right. Okay? Because this book doesn't mean anything to you. And other than my entertainment, it doesn't mean anything to me. Now, let's just say that there was a symbol that you understood Mm -hmm. meant that you're lesser and I'm better than you like a flag. That's something that I might hold up to you to say, hey, nigger, look at this. Mm-hmm. All right? Hey, darky, look at this. These colors don't run. There are various things on my desk that that wouldn't have any effect on you because those things don't have any meaning that way. Mm-hmm. They're ineffectual or, or ineffective, should I say, because you have no connection to them historically. The Confederate flag wasn't then or ever since they first started flying the battle flag after the Civil War as a way to intimidate black people. Never has it been something that is agnostic to black people. It's always been something, unlike this book, I'll put it in your face, you're going to be like, who are those people? That we know what that means. What I'm trying to say is when I hear politicians like her, what they are essentially doing when they stand by these flags, they're culturally codifying the hate. They're saying, hey, us people who are supposed to be mainstream, it's the same thing that she did when she blamed suicide on trans people. She is culturally and politically codifying hate saying it's okay to fuck these people over my question is how many trans people are gonna have to die for nikki haley to realize that what she said wasn't okay because it took nine black bodies for her to change her opinion fresh ones forget about the millions that died the thousands that died it took nine fresh bodies How many fresh trans kids are going to have to die for her to realize that what she's doing now? How many people do we have to spare? And I watched it. And to be honest with you, beyond these two incidents, it was unremarkable. She's a stuffed suit. She offers nothing. Like there's, there's not a compelling reason to even be discussing Nikki Haley in her town hall other than the breathtaking lack of perspective that she had in both that statement and this one because she offered nothing new nothing you haven't heard nothing that's that that's smart or cutting edge in any way yeah but what she did offer up was the same old bumbling bullshit from people who don't understand how much power their words have mm. I, I, it was just, well said just, whatever <laughs> yeah, whatever goddamn nikki haley okay let's do this let's get to the interview with aaron morrison um, from the Associated Press, we're going to talk about some of these black organizations and how fair it is or foul to criticize them for some of the things that they've been criticized for. You guys, I've heard some of the things. I haven't been on that putrid uh, Reddit in forever, but I've heard some of the criticisms, and I think the criticisms that you have uh, 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 about me in this situation are valid. They're valid criticisms, and I'm taking them to heart. So the reason why we're bringing Aaron on is so that we can have a conversation about the best way for me to rectify my critical eye on some of these organizations and to set some standards in the way that we discuss them in a holistic and nutritious way. So Aaron will be on the other side of this break. We have somebody joining us today, um, an award-winning multimedia journalist, it's based in New York City, a national race and ethnicity writer for the Associated Press. Uh, his name is Aaron Morrison. He typically writes about race, civil rights, politics, criminal justice, reform, 
and grassroots social movements. The reason why uh, we have Aaron on today is because we've talked a little bit on the podcast about movements uh, like the BLM, um, led by Patrice Colors, a BLM GNF, and uh, about color of change and some of the roles and uh, controversies surrounding the inner workings of those organizations as of late. I thought it was important to have somebody with knowledge of how charitable organizations and grassroots organizations are supposed to work on the podcast to discuss which parts of this um, might have to do with the dysfunction at those organizations that is, I guess, uh, the, the part and parcel which is par for the course, and which part of this is stuff that should really concern the people that these organizations are intending to help. A little long-winded there, but that's kind of going to be the gist of the conversation. Aaron, thank you for joining us, brother. We appreciate you being on the show today. So I'll start there. Um, I've gotten myself on this podcast, in, in, in trouble on this podcast before. All right, Aaron, I'll be honest with you. I have defended Color of Change. I have defended... BLM GNF because a part of my worldview says, hey, black organizations trying to do good black things for good black people. Sometimes they don't all do it uh, in the right way. They're fledgling. They're new. But a lot of people have said, no, we must hold these organizations accountable uh, for their workplace actions and for the way they raise money and spend money. To someone like me, who has come at it from my uh, from, from my purview and my lens, somebody like you that's an expert in this, what would you say to me? Uh, well, I think two things can be true at the same time. Uh, that, you know, Black-led organizations, particularly nonprofits that come into rather quickly uh, immense amounts of money, um, do face... Uh, a heightened scrutiny over how they then use those donations, that those resources uh, to impact their communities. You know, with with Black Lives Matter being what it is, being such a um, a lightning rod in the space of, of of social justice, but also in American politics, uh, it was kind of inevitable that this organization was going to come under uh, intense scrutiny, not just for uh, its beliefs. And the things that it advocates for, but also for, you know, the the amount of money that they announced, you know, and revealed, uh, you know, that they received. And, and you know, there were going to be people who, first of all, believe that they never deserved any type of money in, in the first place. But then there were also those people who are going to believe that um, why should they be the ones to have that type of uh, responsibility for doling out um, philanthropic dollars to to black uh, black Americans. So you know th that sort of answers your question. It's like you, two things can be true, um, but um, those feelings um, don't often equate to what I found in my reporting to be um, proof of you know the allegations that they've been misusing the funds or that they have swindled the funds. Um, that's that's where we're, you know, um, finding the the push and pull uh, over the discussion of a Black Lives Matter a Global uh, Network Foundation and, and, and any other black led organization, particularly those that have um, risen to prominence um, in the Black Lives Matter movement era. Um, so unlike Van, I've been a little bit more. Oh, OK. Sorry, dog issues over here. I was saying, unlike Van, I've been a little bit more critical um, with some of the information that's come out about like color of change and um, BLM. And I'm wondering for, for you, someone who works in this, write on this, report on this, do you find any of the fitter, do you believe that the criticism is fair? I think the criticism is fair when organizations, black or white, fail to sort of adhere to the um, best practices of transparency. The thing about it is when you become a public organization and you, you are dealing with public money, 
Um, I don't mean taxpayer dollars. I mean money that has been donated to your organization to, to, to support uh, the aims of uh, and, and then the things that you advocate for. There is a level of accountability that should be baked into that. And in one way to be held accountable publicly is to be transparent about not only what money is coming in and what you're going to how you're going to uh, you know, spend that money. Um, you know, there there is um, you, you can't really say, oh, we're we're a fledgling organization and give us some time. Like, yeah, after a while, it's like, OK, now it's time for you to produce uh, evidence and, and proof and results for for this trust that the community, the public has given. So, you know, it's it's not so much about being hard on these organizations. It's just being fair in um, how you uh, go about asking for that transparency, go about asking for that count accountability. Uh, and that's not my opinion. That's just like best practices and, and standards of, of philanthropy. Um, these organizations, when they are nonprofits, they are by law asked to provide the public with an accounting of how they've spent their money, how much they pay their executives, how much uh, they spend on programming uh, and, and what percentage of their money that they, they they spend on on things that directly benefit the people. If if that uh, information is below the standard, then yeah, that's a fair reason to 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 ask some tough questions about what they're doing with the with the money. And again, that's not my opinion. That's just like industry standard stuff. So um, yeah, I mean that, that sort of answers your question, Rachel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, based upon your opinion and your expert opinion, the work that you've done. You've seen the story. I'm sure you've read all the reporting that's come out about Black Lives Matter, and particularly Patrice Cullors and the the uh, the inner workings of the organization over there. Do you suppose that there's some sort of grift going on with that situation? Let Let me be absolutely clear. the the um, The allegations of of grifting or of misuse of funds, mismanagement of funds, has been. Um, reviewed by independent auditors uh, when, when it pertains to Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation. And there is no proof that those allegations are true. Now, the, I, should, I should restate that. The allegations are unproven. And I, I, I often like to say this to people who I talk to just in, in regular conversation. You know, I'm a journalist who deals with fact and truth. And please believe, the moment there is proof that an organization like Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation or any black led organization, the moment there's proof of mis mismanagement, misuse, fraud, grifting, it is my duty to report that. So the moment I have uh, proof of that, I am going to come forward with that because that is not only in the public interest, um, that is, uh, uh, you know, in direct contradiction to the idea of justice that we sh we would shield black organizations from being held accountable when they are indeed violating the public's trust so um you know to answer your question van yeah i mean i i i can't say that there's grifting because just based on the review of the uh publicly available documents there's nothing to suggest that that is even remotely true now have they set themselves up or left room um, for criticism based on the structure of their nonprofit, the 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 uh, the way in which they are running the organization? Sure, you could argue that. Uh, and I've, I've reported that in my my own reporting for the Associated Press uh, last year. I had a, a nonprofit um, expert, you know, essentially tell me, like, look, if if there's no evidence here that they are misusing the funds, but they kind of set themselves up for. Uh, this idea that that very few people are making decisions about tens of millions of dollars, um, which that yeah that that leaves rooms for room for for criticism and um, until they plug those holes uh, and and build out the infrastructure, there's always going to be folks who who believe that um, you know that there is not a whole lot of democracy, there's not a whole lot of public uh, levers for for accountability within that organization. Uh, can, I ask one, can I ask one? Can I ask one follow sure. up? Um, how are they getting it wrong? I and the reason why I ask that is because there's been a fixation, um, and rightly so, 
about some of the optics surrounding uh, what, how the money is being spent. There was a house that was bought that was the central focus of a lot of the reporting. There was the fact that people in Patrice Cullors' family were giving jobs and given postings. Um, the, the, the latest reporting that came out about it talked about the fact that of the $90 million that had been raised, it seemed that 30% of it, 33% of it had been doled out. And that some of the organizations that had been doled out to were people that people that were hot, the higher ups at Black Lives Matter, the BL, BLM, GNF knew. OK, um, some of that stuff seems like, well, I can understand how they only gave out 30 million dollars of 90 million dollars. I mean, they the, the money goes to various places. Other parts of it look untoward. If you're looking at everything that's come out, how should they be doing it? What are they doing wrong? Um, again, I'm, it's not my place to say that they are doing something wrong. I, I can only say what they are doing that it, that is, um, outside of, 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 yeah. of, uh, industry standard when it comes to nonprofits. So, you know, one, one thing that, that, you know, experts will say about, you know, um, an organization like Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation is that they rely heavily on consultants. Uh, one of the consultants, uh, based on a, a tax filing from last year, one of their consultants, um, who is also a, a member of the board of, of Black Lives Matter, Matter uh, Global Network Foundation, uh, was paid uh, over $2 million in consultancy fees. And that $2 million went to his firm. This is Bowers uh, Consulting. Um, and, and that's um, Shalomia Bowers, I should, should name him. Um, you know, his firm essentially received $2 million, more than $2 million to provide staffing support, fundraising support, um, and, and a lot of other services that, um, you know, helped Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation get off the ground after it saw that $90 million pour in uh, after the, the 2020 protests. So um, I asked an expert and they said, well, that is not that unusual for a new nonprofit. New nonprofits, very small nonprofits, once they get their tax exempt uh, status, will often hire an outside firm to come in and just help them set up shop, um, provide this type of support that an in-house staff would provide if they were a more mature uh, foundation. But because they weren't, and because they struggled with who should run it? You know, you, you mentioned Patrice Cullors being one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter at one time was the, the executive director of the foundation. But once she was in a position to transition out of leadership there, um, she brought in Bowers Consulting to provide what Black Lives Matter really didn't have at that point, which was a in-house staff to run just the day to day business of the foundation. And that means that, yeah, making sure you got the accountants right and and and. Uh, lawyers and um, people who can run the actual programming that is supposed to benefit the public. So, um, you know, that's that's one area of criticism if if we're talking about like the reliance on consultants. And and the argument there would be, how long do you rely on those consultants before it starts to look like, yeah, it is just a few people benefiting from the, you know, the this, this uh, uh, endowment that the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation now has. So I think, I think you know, give it a couple of years. And if, if we still see the, the structure of Black Lives Matter to be the same as it is right now, that again, that does not necessarily necessarily mean criminality or fraud. It just means that, um, you know, this this idea of growth and maturing of a foundation may not have happened if they're still operating in the same way that they have been in the last couple of years. Aaron, something you just said, and I think this goes to, because Van, Van, I believe, asked how. It's like, why? We know that as Black people, we are scrutinized more heavily in every single aspect of what we do in both personal and professional in this society, in, in the world. So do having a Black-led charity, you also know that they're going to be heavily scrutinized and all eyes are going to be on them, especially in the aftermath of uh, 2020, George Floyd, and the fact that they reported how much money came into them. And something you said uh, about when Patrice Cullors left, she brought in this consulting firm, which helped them get more of a structure and an in-house staff. 
Why was that not done before? Because I know one of the issues that people had was the governance structure of BLM and the fact that, you know, there wasn't really an executive director or maybe there was and or like she it, it appeared based on the structure she had more power more voting power than anyone else and there was no in-house staff why was that not done while she was there but then after and if if you don't know I'll, I'll do a follow up oh so i i can say i can start to answer that question a bit there had been a managing director of the black lives matter global network foundation prior to patrice coming on as executive director that person had been at odds with the grassroots uh, organizers of Black Lives Matter across the country. So as things really, this is actually prior to uh, 2020. So as things were uh, really starting to grow um, for for Black Lives Matter as, as, I hate to say as a brand, but like as a, an organization that people could sort of point to as, as uh, leading a, a, a generational movement uh, towards justice, um, you know, they brought it. They, Black Lives Matter did bring in people who they thought could help to sort of build the plane as they were flying it, so to speak. Um, and what ended up happening is, is the, some of the folks that they brought in in the earlier days were at odds with the grassroots uh, you know, organizers who felt like they needed to have more of a say in how things were being built, how this organization was going to mature into into the future, into a, a legacy organization, uh, so to speak. So once they were at an impasse with this former managing director, that managing director was essentially uh, you know, asked to resign. Uh, and that's uh, when Patrice Cullors came in to uh, briefly, uh, let's let's be clear, briefly lead the organization. Uh, and at the at the time that she was leading the organization, that's when she hired the consulting firm to come in and and build out some of that infrastructure. Um, so so th to to answer the question, there had been attempts to create that staffing that that in house staffing that Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation needed, but um, that that didn't materialize because of some um, internal. Um, conflict between organizers uh, on the ground level and folks at the national organization. Um, so color of change, uh, are you familiar with some of the re recent criticisms surrounding color of change? Um, and have you read some of the reporting on that? I have read uh, some of the reporting on that. I am, I'm not as familiar with the inner workings of, of color change. I just want to say that up front. Um, but you know, certainly, you know, it, the nonprofit world, uh, it, there, there's a there's a lot um, in the same way that you might see um, dysfunction um, and and problems with management in public, you know, or corporate organizations. The same thing can exist in nonprofits, and I think what what we see with the the, the color of change um, story, with the, with the allegations with, uh, that came out in, in the in the story that was recently published, I think it's 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 evidence of you know the the, the push and pull between um, maintaining sort of a your your mission statement, your uh, forward facing uh, for the people. Um, fighting white supremacy sort of image and a reality behind the scenes where everything may not be as um as as neat as 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 you would want the you know the public to believe so um that's all i can say about that i i don't have my own independent reporting of of uh, the the inner workings of color of change but i do know that just like black lives matter global network foundation and and other organizations in um, in the, the movement space, there's drama, you know, and, and, and let me be clear. I'm not saying it, there's, there's drama is one thing. And then allegations of sexual assault and, and other things and sexual harassment, that's a whole nother thing. That's a criminal matter. So I don't, I don't want to equate those two things, drama and, 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 and criminal um, allegations. But, um, you know, in the same way that that can exist in any, you know, white led you know corporate organization the same thing can happen in 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 you know organizations that are are founded and run by folks in our community and the, and again it's it really comes down to like transparency and accountability and your willingness to be held to 
um, a standard that someone might say not a higher standard than anybody else, but just to a standard uh, that that is uh, fair, equitable, and, um, and you know, and, and it, at the end of the day, shows your organization to be one that is uh, doing what its mission statement says. Yeah, we have uh, Black Lives Matter, GNF. You have Color of Change, and there seems to be more negative than positive things that have been said about these national organizations that we know have done a lot for the community, but the narrative right now appears to be negative. And I believe it was your reporting, and I'm sorry if I'm getting this wrong, that showed how much BLM, GNF brought in this year, this past year versus the years before. Their assets are significantly less. They spent more money than they brought in. I'm wondering, how do we restore this to, to let people know that, yes, there's been drama, as you said. Yes, there have been issues, but there's still the intent and the meaningful work um, is still being done. And how do you do you think that can happen, one? And then the other part is, do you think that the the loss that BLM, GNF suffered is because of the drama or just because, um, you know, people aren't as excited, to, for lack of better words, about racial justice as they were in 2020 and around that time? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, my reporting, uh, my recent reporting, you know, states that, that they that Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation raised nine million dollars in the, the last fiscal year that they, they are reporting to the IRS. Now, um, that is less than the 79 million that they reported in the previous fiscal year. But we have to take this all in context. You know, if you're reporting uh, 79 millions off of uh, coming out of the racial justice, uh, 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 you know, uprising, really, that we saw in 2020 and 2021. Um, you cannot expect then in, in 2021 to 2020, late 2021 to 2022, that you would raise anywhere near that much money. Why? Because we know that um, the, the unique circumstances of what was going on in 2020 um, did not continue on in 2021 and 2022. So um, it's, it, you know, it, it's somewhat like common sense to know that, like, you're not going to raise $79 million yeah, every certainly. single year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, that's just mm -hmm. not going to happen. Because right. uh, mm -hmm. then it would be Black Lives Matter LeBron James Ex fund. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It would be like, the, you know what I mean? It would be like, right. the, they're not going to do that every single year. Right. That was uh, like super normal because of what happened with but George. But $9 million just seems... A lot, <laughs> like a, a huge dive. And I'm wondering, yeah. is it contributed to some of the other things that we've discussed? I think that. OK, let me just not say what I will pine on this. I, I can tell you what my reporting says. My reporting says that, yes, these were unique factors that uh, that contributed to an explosion for racial justice organizations writ large in 2020. So. We're not just talking about Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation. We're talking about nearly every racial justice organization that that was out there in the field doing work and organizing and, 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 and were, were visible. They received the, the hundreds of millions of dollars that was donated not only from people's pockets, but from other uh, organizations, uh, silent uh, donors who came forward and said, I'm, I'm donating, you know, uh, this $100,000 here or a half a million dollars here to your organization to, to, to do the work so that we don't have to see any more George Floyds. Um, that happened in 2020. That's that's not going to happen in 2022. It's certainly not going to happen this year. I'm not I don't have crystal ball, but I'm just saying, like, you know, this is this is not the environment that we're in right now where we would see that type of public support and swell of support for uh, racial justice organizations. So that's number one. But number two, you know, I think that if people were willing to to continue donating to organizations like Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, and they saw some of the reporting that came out about the purchase of property, uh, about uh, family members of founders of Black Lives Matter, you know, benefiting and having contracts with uh, the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, when that information is not put into context, um, that can create the perception that, yes, there, there something's not right within the organization. And so 
would it be shocking or surprising that the level of support that Black Lives Matter then uh, receives from donors after the, that reporting comes out, that it would drop? Yeah, that's not surprising at all. Um, but I, again, I think it's just important that we always lead with that context that we're not in 2020 right now. We are not in 20 early 2021. This is well removed, three years removed from the murder of George Floyd and therefore the environment for raising and funding racial justice movement organizations is entirely different. Uh, and so as long as we acknowledge that, uh, I, I think I started uh, our, our chat by saying like, two things can be true at the same time, that some people have soured on supporting Black Lives Matter since 2020, and that we're just in a different time. And so there, there's no way we would see that same level of support going to an organization uh, like Black Lives Matter Global Network or, or any other Black-led organization that's uh, you know, baked in to their mission is fighting white supremacy. Hmm. Um, I, I really appreciate your time. And I'm going to ask you one last question. Um, I'm going to start with something that I've realized. I've realized that I cannot hate white supremacy more than I love black people. I love black people um, with all of my heart. Uh, and sometimes I am such... Uh, I'm so vigilant <laughs> about white supremacists and 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 people attacking black people that I have to remember that sometimes they're black people to protect, be it uh, from black lives inside of Black Lives Matter, inside of Color of Change, and I have to make sure that I that I uh, prioritize those people and not just who might be writing about them or whatever. And not saying that Sean or any of those two people are weapons of white supremacy, just saying that what happens. Aaron, is that when I see these things brought up, I see them brought up on Fox News. I see them brought up on Breitbart. I see this stuff used to weaponize and paint black people and black led organizations um, as people who are grifting, as people who are taking advantage of the pain uh, surrounding George Floyd's death or Mike Brown's death or Tamir Rice's death. And I get upset. Because, like I've said before, the this person only wants to, this person is a race hustler, this person is a race pimp, is something that is always used to depower those who might stand in the gap for us. I can't let that be the whole thing. I understand that. I can't let that be the whole thing when there are actual issues going on. So, in your opinion, for somebody like me, what is... Um, a nutritious and holistic way to criticize taking my emotions out of it. Uh, because I, I can't just say, hey, don't come at these places because there are some issues there. And at the same time, I don't want to be a, the, the, the part of the, the chorus of people who lets them take everything that we try to do and that we try to establish and then weaponize it against us. So for someone that's covering this stuff, you do it for a living. What's the best way for, for me to do this um, in a dispassionate but nutritious way for people? Well, I, I think it's important that, n number one, that we understand um, there, there, there are two things that can happen here. Folks like Patrice Cullors and Rashad Robinson and many other people who've been seen as you know uh, leaders in the racial justice space, particularly in the Black Lives Matter uh, movement space, they are public figures. So I don't want at all uh, for people to think that we have to have, you know, uh, some sort of sympathy for them because they are black public figures or black leaders in our community. Um, you know, I, I lead with empathy for everybody, first of all. But, um, you know, these are folks who are public figures. So um, though these are the faces of uh, 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 the faces that we often intend to and should hold accountable and, and ask for transparency and, um, and, 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 and the like. Um, but we also should be mindful. Uh, and this is coming from my reporting. This is not my opinion here. Um, that folks who step out in front and are the face of, of, of something like a, a movement like Black Lives Matter, um, they are also targets. Uh, and so when we feed into some of the narrative uh, about this person being a grifter or that person stealing money or that person uh, uh, being being uh, fraudulent, you know, there is a real world consequence to um, that type of thing when we all feed into that. Um, and what I'm saying is these folks have had to hire security. 
um, because of how uh, vicious and um, strong a lot of the criticism, both online and in person, um, that that they face as you know leaders in the faces of this movement. So I would say to 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 anyone that's looking to 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 hold these folks accountable, to hold these organizations accountable, is to to really uh, to your words. Um, remove some of the emotion out of the person and hold the organization accountable. These organizations are meant to be publicly accountable. They're not supposed to be operating in shadow and in secret. Uh, nonprofits have to disclose how, what they receive and how they spend their money. It is perfectly fine to hold the organization, the group accountable for that. But when we start attacking people, I just want to say that from my reporting, there are real world consequences for those those things. So that's what I would I would say is that you can certainly be passionate about um, how these organizations are actually benefiting our communities and want those folks to be um, held to a, a standard that is acceptable for 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 anybody. But we should be careful um, that we do that in a way that does not endanger the lives of not just the the folks uh, that are the public face of these things, um, but also their families, um, because that 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 is a real world consequence for how um, Black Lives Matter um, has been received in the world. Uh, is that that some of the folks who have really stood out there in front uh, were made less safe um, for doing that. And 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 let's just be clear: this is not new. Our leaders going back well into the earliest days of, of the civil rights movement. And I'm talking about the 1930s and 40s and 50s. Those folks were also made unsafe, not just by um, the public positions that they were taking, the things that they were advocating for, the direct action that they were taking out in the streets uh, and in their communities and the marches that they led, but they were not safe. They were made not safe by um, infighting, and and things happening within the community as well. So so you know I I would just say that that that, that is historical. That's not you know opinion. That's 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 just the truth. That we can disagree about uh, movement tactics. We can disagree about who should be in charge. Uh, but the moment that we make it so vicious that people uh, are no longer safe, uh, then then I I think. That's that's where we should maybe take take a moment uh, to to pause and and and, and take some reflection, um, because uh, you know we don't want our leaders, you know we 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 I think we said uh, a generation ago or maybe more than that that we're tired of seeing our leaders die. Uh, we're tired of seeing our leaders taken from us. But if we are the ones attacking them too, uh, then what can we expect? I mean, there's there's a consequence for that. So mm. so, you know, I, I would say yeah, that, that that's the way to, to, to look at it. Black Lives Matter, Global Network Foundation, Color of Change, any organization should be held publicly responsible and should be transparent about the activities that they do on behalf of the communities that, that they advocate for. Um, but the personal attacks that that has consequences. And, and I, I think um, as long as we can find a happy medium, a balance between those things. Um, then, then may maybe we would be heading in the right direction. But again, not my opinion. I'm just saying my reporting backs up that uh, there has there there's real world consequence for the the narrative that that it currently exists for uh, for Black Lives Matter and, and uh, associated organizations. Aaron Morrison, we'll stop right there. Thank you so much. You've made us smarter today. Um, and you know I'm going to do a better job. I'm going to take myself... Look, I'm not going to get emotional anymore. Oh. All right, no okay. more emotion. Man, don't make promises <laughs> won't, you can't keep. You're going to try. And, no, I and we respect I'm gonna, that. I'm going to try... Look, no, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try not to be as emotional, Aaron. We'll, like, we'll, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Thank you so much, brother. We appreciate you. That's Aaron Morrison um, from the Associated Press, award-winning journalist. Thank you for joining us on Higher Learning today, brother. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Rach, what did you think about that conversation? What did you think? What's your thoughts? I think Aaron is fantastic, and I thought he was really fair in the way that he spoke about it. And I think also he got to you. You claim that you're yeah. now not going to be as emotional. Well, you said you're being done, and I want I want to like manage your expectations here. You're going to try, but 
I think that what he said was very fair. And I, and to be and if if you're going to check yourself, to check myself, sometimes I'm too much on the opposite end of the spectrum where I don't know if I necessarily criticize the person, but I am very critical of the organization and maybe sometimes too much tie the person to it. So I think what Aaron, the perspective that Aaron gave was a lot, was, was middle ground and we should aim to look at it. We all should. And under that perspective. Hmm. Well said. So look, I, I'm, I'm proposing a new segment oh. on higher learning. Oh. And the segment's called, we got to talk about Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. Look, I'm from Louisiana. I'm from Louisiana. So it's not like it's going. Y'all just don't make the news. Yeah. We just, <laughs> we, like, our fuckery just, you know, we got Ronald Green. Y'all we got all kinds of terrible things going on in the state. Okay. Just don't do whatever. Um, but Texas is, Texas is the proving ground for right wing fuckery right now. Texas and Florida are in an uh, intense battle. They're in a competition. In yes. Battle. Um, so there's a new law in Texas. And I want to know what you think about this from a legal standpoint. This call has been legal eagle. Donnie, give me the sound. Um, uh, limiting local regulations. So Texas, it seems, wants there to be uh, legislative consistency across the entire state. There's essentially a bill on the docket right now, and we'll get to who sponsored this bill in a second. The bill is uh, Resolution 2127, and what it would do is strip cities of the ability to set standards for local workplaces pa- to ensure civil rights and to improve their environments. Like, what is what is that? When you hear that, what does that mean from a legal standpoint? What are they trying to do, Rach? I mean, basically, they're trying to take the right away from cities, and they're doing it under preemption. I mean, it's a it's a practice known as that, but they're asserting their dominance as a state over these localities, which is a problem when it comes to voting. This is why it affects you as a citizen in particular, because the reason the Republicans are doing it, and it's not just Texas. I, as I was looking into this, I was like, oh, wait, it's not just Texas. Other states are doing it as well. But we know that these larger states, when they do it, then it spreads like wildfire throughout the rest of these red states. They watch, they learn, they implement. Um, but what's happening is they're coming in, Republicans, Republican-led states, and They want power where they don't have it. So over these democratic cities, these larger cities, which have a lot of voters, and they're coming in to these localities and preempting the city ordinances and the laws that exist within the localities and saying, well, if it contradicts what the state law is, then we reign over you. And it is Mm. literally taking the voice away From if you're voting for an elected official within your city, it doesn't matter that you're voting for somebody who's going to honor what it is that you want for yourself and the the constituents. The state can say, you know what, that goes against us. And so it affects so many different issues like LGBTQ rights for employees. Um, Where else? I had a list, running list. But you get what I'm saying. Thank you. You get what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But apparently... Where did I see this? There have been more than 650 preemption bills in state legislatures across the country this year alone. And the reason that this, I wanted to talk about it is because, and we're starting to bring this up. One, we're coming up on an election year, but two, all the underhanded things that are being done within these states that we're not talking about or are are going under the radar, 650 this year, more than that. And that we have no idea. And it's just so the Republicans can gain power, but also it's taking away our rights. And they are getting more, as we've talked about, more and more creative in how they're doing it. Yeah. So because sometimes there'll be a city ordinance against discrimination of LGBTQ plus people. Sometimes there'll be a city ordinance that said these are the labor laws. And what they're saying is, is if we say it in the state uh, that you that you have to go by what we say and you can't do your own city thing. I think this mm-hmm. is interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, this is against what I would consider to be the ethos of the Republicans. They're like not big government people. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like what DeSantis like the, was doing with uh, Disney. Yes. 
it's it's like Republicans are, and obviously they're so they're they're hypocritical to the point to where it doesn't even make any sense to point out the inconsistencies anymore. But they're they're small government on the only thing that they're small government on is money. They don't want to pay any taxes, right? They don't want any to pay any taxes. Everything else, they're huge government. We want let's do a federal abortion ban. Let's do uh, let's spin take all the money and get the biggest most bloated military budget we ever we we ever could have. Let's spin 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 spin. And if you guys don't think that Republicans be spending, that's the you know how women be shopping. <laughs> Republicans be spending, so. spin their asses off. Spin 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 spin. Um, but in this, it would seem like people that are in that are states rights and all of that would be in favor of letting a group of people govern themselves the way that they want to govern themselves, letting Houston or San Antonio or Dallas govern themselves the way they want to govern themselves and to keep Austin essentially out. Is Austin the capital of Texas? Yes. And to keep Austin out of their business because I'm seeing uh, situations where you know, the mayor of San Antonio, uh, people in Houston are saying this is bad because it takes away our ability to make laws that affect the local climate that we know that we live in. So they're going to be less impactful. But we are in a incredible era of the Republicans trying to reshape parts of America where they have less influence into the into what they want them to be. And it's like if if we had if the country right now was reflective of the morals and values of the majority of Americans, like things would be so much different than, than what they are right now. We're getting to a point, Nikki Haley said earlier, uh, you're letting a small percentage of, 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 she's talking about trans people, dictate this entire societal shift as if the Republicans and the far right wackos aren't, don't make up a much smaller percentage of Americans in terms of the way we're looking at the country. People always say half the country, half the it's not half the country. It's not. You know what I mean? Um, I thought this was just really, but I, I'll tell you what, I, I did a little digging here. If you guys have a problem with preemption in Texas and other places, uh, I, the, the guy who started this, you can give him a call. His name is Dustin Burroughs. Uh, he's the one who's sponsoring this. Dustin Burroughs, okay? You can mail him. He's an attorney out of Lubbock. He's a state representative there in Texas, Dustin Burroughs. This is his phone number. Uh, 512-463-0542. That's his phone number at the Capitol office. At the district office, his phone number is 806-795-0635. That's 806-795-0635. This is an elected representative I'm not giving away this man's personal situations. I would like people to call Dustin when you get a chance, check in on him, and let him know that you think places should be able to have their local ordinances to protect and serve the people that live where they are. And that Texas should not be uh, subject to the regulatory capture of Republican uh, leaning identity politics and all of that stuff. But it's not just, it's not just, it's not just Texas. I have to be clear with that. When I said 650, that's across the country. Florida has a wild bill where that they just passed in May that allows businesses to challenge municipal ordinances in court if they find that they're being unreasonable with the ordinance, that's it. That's how broad it is. And then these businesses can collect up to $50,000 in attorney's fees. It's wild, the things that they are doing. It's not just Texas. So in addition to this guy, find all the other people in the state who are proposing, in the states that are proposing these type of bills because the whole goal is just so the Republicans can take over, take away your vote and your rights, and they can take over. Yeah, try to pass the buff for Texas. I see the. I see no, I want you to know there. it's everywhere. Hello, I'm the one who introduced <laughs> this topic because I was like, "Woo, Greg Abbott is yeah. wild, doing his thing." Yeah, <laughs> he really I mean, is, though. Uh, oh, guess who's back? Fresh and fit. Did they leave us? They left our podcast. Yeah, we haven't talked about him in a while. Um, so look, so. there's apparently a beef that's going on over there. 
in the YouTube podcast space. Mm-hmm. Say YouTube mm-hmm. podcast space because these are two different platforms that uh, are very prevalent on YouTube. There's two guys, their names are Abba and Preach, and they have uh, a YouTube channel that's very successful. There's two million subscribers over there doing their thing. Um, and they, I don't know all the backstory. I've been preached, who I've heard of before, uh, are in some way at odds. And just but but before you guys tell me something problematic about I've been preach, I I've seen a couple of videos. I really don't know what they do. I know that they are YouTubers and that they are very successful. Don't have any issue with with whatever. But I don't. Before you say, hey man, don't defend these guys. They said this about this person. I've been I've hated them for years. I know you guys. Whenever something there always comes up that somebody said something on Twitter and that I'm, well, I don't know yeah. uh, enough about them. Yeah. The okay. point is this but, issue and not anything. I we, I didn't even know who they were until this. So that I'm I'm we're speaking right, from I this point on. Okay. Yeah, I I heard of them before. They're 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 pretty big deals. They're pretty big deals. Yeah, in they, terms react of, they, to, a, they react to they react to moments. Yeah, that and they talk and, about things yeah. that are that are uh are socially relevant that their audience cares about. I'm not sure if they would be considered in the manosphere or not. Well, they used to be know. friends with Fresh and Fit. They used to be they used okay. to be cool, from my understanding and looking at all of this. And then I guess Fresh and Fit, which is on brand, took things to a level where they started to comment and react to their videos, and Fresh and Fit didn't like that. So then there was this. There's it's been going on for a couple of years. This back and forth of taking low oh. blows. Um, fresh and fit. I hate that I know way too much about this, but in researching for this pot for this subject, I learned more than I wanted to. Fresh and fit started taking digs at Preach's wife, and then they actually ended up apologizing to their audience and said, "That's not the type of podcast that they are, or YouTubers that they are. They don't get in the drama." And so, even when Abba and Preach responded to the to that video, they didn't respond. So they just kind of let it go. But I guess it got to a point where maybe Abba and Preach were doing a little bit too much uh, in reacting, and we have this. So uh, Myron from Fresh and Fit went on a live stream with Sneeko and Zerka. And he put on a clan hood. And uh, talked about his beef with Abba and Preach. Everybody in this situation is black. Abba and Preach are black. Fresh and Fit are black. And this is what Myron did. Some audio from what Myron said and did when he was uh, on the live stream. Hold on, pause right quick. Pause right. This nigga right here is funny. He's funny, this nigga. I don't condone this N-word. Shut up, you Albanian fat. <laughs> Keep running the clip, you train. Who's that weird n- that can't speak? Who's that? He black as hell. <laughs> Shit, who's this gay n- here with the red? What the fuck is going on? What in tarnation fucking pussy shit is that? Mad respect to minorities. What the fuck? Stop! What? what, what I want to get another what? one. Preach is crying right now, swinging from a monkey branch, Bro. eating a banana, playing some Donkey Kong on an N64 because he's a stupid prick. He's a window licking stupid n- what? That n- spin. I like that. <laughs> I like that. This video that we, we got these n- to? running like it's an employment line. What the f? What? Don't do that. I will find you, you fucking stinky looking piece of shit. You go fucking find right here. I don't like you already. I never ever compare that Myron dude to them fucking Jews, you motherfucker. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. Th- this, this is, this is not I was representative. Born this way, you ch- Keep going, ch- Later on, Myron from Fresh and Fit came on and he said that what he was basically doing was a Clayton Bixby routine. That Dave Chappelle did that same thing when he was on the Chappelle show and that it's comedy when he's making fun of Abba and Preach. I'll tell you why we're discussing this. I know you guys don't want to fucking hear about Fresh and Fit anymore on the podcast. We're discussing this because sometimes there's there are opportunities to have not important conversations, but slightly larger conversations about uh, conduct or speech that exists out there. I'm a free speech person. 
love people's opportunity to say what it is they feel like they need to say. We've heard from Fresh and Fit before. We've heard Fresh and Fit denigrate black women uh, and talk about how they don't like black women and how they don't date black women, uh, calling names and that entire thing. We've seen the treatment of black women, of women, period, on the Fresh and Fit show from time to time. Okay. Uh, The arguments that would be made is that, look, this is our preference. We don't have to like black ladies. Uh, we don't have to respect or hold them up or, you know, whatever, whatever. They responded to that and they said, oh, we're not, you know, my mother's black, all of this stuff like that, whatever, whatever. Um, but when I, when I watch this, just the reality is that this is vile, nasty, dirty stuff. Now, you guys know that I make jokes that are based in race. But like, there were Heil Hitlers being thrown. There were anti-Semitic things being said that the N-word is being used with a Klan hood on. It's one thing to say nigga, nigga this, nigga that, nigga that. When you put a Klan hood on, you have to wonder why this is the way that Myron chose to get at Abba and preach. It makes it like I, I I'm I don't get it. Like I it seems to me some health self hating coon ass shit. A hundred percent. Like it, and it it and you know I don't want to get into a back and forth name calling type of situation, but what's the point of that? If you don't like these guys or you have a problem with these guys for whatever reason, once you put the clan hoodie on, and once you start with the Hitler stuff. Now everybody's in that. Like, why are we? Like, why? Why is that where we went? Like, Nick Fuentes popped on this. Oh, just I let saw. you guys know. Later on, later on in this same stream, noted white supremacist Nick Fuentes jumped on. Like, what are we doing? I believe it is obviously self hatred, and we talked about that when we saw how they talked about black women. But it's coupled with white acceptance. Their self-hatred. It's like they're so they so want to be anti-black that they separate themselves from what they feel is what can be considered a stereotypical black and feel like that they're they don't align themselves with those type of people. And they're doing it to gain the the acceptance of white people. When you looked at Myron on that live and he's there saying homophobic slurs, racist slurs. I mean, he's doing it and he's getting giddy at the reaction that he's getting from a Nick Fuentes or a Zerko, is that his name? Or um what's Sneeko? Zerk uh Zerka Zerko Sneeka. I mean a uh, Sneeko is like the right like the number two under an Andrew Tate. Andrew Tate has been on Fresh and Fit's podcast. N now they're talking to Nick Fuentes or who they have before. They want so badly to be in this world and accepted by these people that they're willing to say everything that what they want is call comedy, but they're really just doing it to please these white folks. That's what that is. And their self-hatred is being used as self-destruction, not just of themselves, but of other black people and all the other communities that they offended during that, that quote unquote comedy rant that he now wants to say it was. And just to be clear, the whole Clayton Bixby thing, the fact that you want to compare yourself to what he did on the day on what Dave Chappelle did in that skit, he was mocking the absurdity of people that fresh and fit are. And that was not real life. They He was not coming after real, actual people. It was a skit. What you did was speak hate speech towards two particular people and entire communities. That's not the same thing. You can't slap comedy on it and try to make it all okay. It was intentional. You know, there was a time when I wanted to go on their podcast. And mm. I, I want to, so I'll tell you why. I want to go on their podcast because I was interested in the whole high value man conversation because 
I thought that it was rooted in youthful exuberance. I just remember, I don't know if I've talked about this on the podcast before. I just remember having conversations with guys at 25 or 26. And the things that they would say would be like, a woman got to do this for me. A woman got to do that for me. A woman has got to do this. A woman has got to do that. Like, this is what. And I just remember, like, having those conversations with people and then watching them grow into men that their relationships looked in, looked to nothing like that. Is that these are guys that became successful and became uh, like financially viable. They're in shape. They're all of those things that everyone would say, but they became men who realized that to have a woman in your life that you valued, that valued you, that there was a give and a take and that you couldn't dictate to them who you wanted them to be. And so, you know, my point in talking about any of that stuff, because, you know, I was never going to be able to have a conversation with any of those other dudes. My point was that, you know, this is like, I was going to, I wanted to poke holes in it, not in the, even in a super confrontational way, but I wanted to just intellectually poke holes in the idea that uh, some of the things that they were saying and that maybe they didn't even believe. And if you follow some of the stories of Fresh and Fit, you know that they obviously didn't believe some of it. <laughs> but but um, then there was a turn. There was a turn where this stuff and I don't think I knew very much about the manosphere at that point. Anyway, I just thought these were people that were talking about relationship dynamics. I think that there was a turn and there was a turn where all of this stuff became, um, either became or as I delved more into it, I saw that it is really destructive. Mm -hmm. Like it's not even, I mean, obviously, you know, Andrew Tate, it's not even just a little destructive. It's really destructive. Mm -hmm. Like it's really Bad, like not bad in the sense, well, these guys are crazy. They believe this bad in the sense of these are intellectual enemies. Yeah. And it's it's yeah. snowballed, right? It's snowballed from these are maybe some young guys with with immature slash bad ideas about male female dynamics, which it's 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 a. Uh, it's fine with, with me for them to believe whatever they want to believe. If you're mm -hmm. one of the guys out there and you say, hey, a, a woman should clip my toenails every Tuesday night. Dog, if that's how you feel, I'm going to tell you why that might, might not work out for you. But if that's how you feel, that's how you feel. I'm going to tell you why that's probably a bad way to look at your life. Um, but if that's how you feel, that's how you feel. But it went from that to really ugly shit. Yeah. Yeah. Like a lot of ugliness, like a, a lot of ugliness. Um, and now it's to a point to where, and not, I'm not saying that that wasn't ugly. I'm saying that I might have been unaware at a point at this, the seriousness of all of this talk and the evolution. That's the word. Of, of the evolution of, of sort of uh, belittling people in that way and like how you really forget about being a high value man, do you value people? Do you value people at all? Do, do you value, is there anything about those guys that is sacred to them? Like, like why are you playing like that? Because like even, not even trying to be, a, not even trying to be a dick or even look down my nose and uh, point a morality uh, ruler at someone. Just like, for real? Uh, a clan hoodie? Because they value what's, what's, likes. And the attention and the growing audience, they got suspended from YouTube for hate speech, for some speeches that they did at the beginning of their career, and they gained followers during like the week they had off. And they, they're they looking at that and saying, this is what tapping into these people, aligning ourselves with white supremacists, having these this hate speech, they and, and then saying, oh, it's just comedy and people are too sensitive. They know that it's growing their audience and their bank accounts, and that's what they value right now. I mean, I don't understand how you can even put on Afro wigs and braided wigs and say all these derogatory things when you are a black person. I, I, I as if you're dip. That's what I mean about the self hatred is so deep. You don't even think that you that you're black. You have separated yourself from what it is to be black, all because you want to be accepted by white people, which we know is deeply rooted. We've gone into the history of that. They embody that. Well, and I, I, I got, I just have to bring it up. There is 
another dynamic there that is also going to 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 make people just raise eyebrows with people about how they look uh at black americans um now i'm not sure about abba and preach's nationalities or whatever but you know fresh and fit when we talk about how they view black people i've heard them say before that hey uh, uh, uh well, one of them is from one of the islands he's like hey when people would come to the islands and i would get with women there in the islands these were white women so I was I looked at a white standard of beauty and you're here in America and like whatever I uh, believe uh, well these other guy, brothers is 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 uh, from outside of the states so this might have to do with a particular way that they look at black Americans that they look at blackness and how they feel about women might be a symptom of that a symptom of their overall worldview and a proximity to a wanting to be white or a white way of viewing the world more than just them fucking around on the internet and, and and trying to be bros. And that's not to say that that's any less destructive. It's trying to say that there's, there's something, there's something here. Like this is wild and weird. It and is weird. But there's, when you talk about the physical appearance of black people, that doesn't have it that doesn't always have to do with where you that you're not a black American. I mean, well, I and that's what, what they I'm were and that's that, what they were getting into. No, no, I no, I get that. I'm not. What I'm saying is that like there might be because brothers do that here all the time, and black women do it all the time too. They talk about like, we did it through you black ass, whatever, whatever. So I'm not saying that that's something that 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 doesn't exist uh, out that that only exists outside these borders. But what I'm saying is there might not be. Uh, we might not be in simpatico in terms of needing to lift certain people up mm. that are here in America that live in Miami where you're from or like uh, around to the places that are really consuming the content. There might not be like these people don't seem to be like they're on any it will have any cultural oneness with us. They seem to actually hate black people. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. With you. Uh, because there's no way, there's no way, no matter who I had a beef with, that I'm going to do the uh, Klan thing, the Heil Hitler stuff, all of that stuff. Whew. Man, oh, man. I guess do it for the clout. All right. We get out of here. Oh, before we do that, uh, let, let's talk about something. Rachel wanted to bring something up. Um, that you saw on the internet. Look, let's get into this. <laughs> Just there to be was clear, a tweet. This is Van. <laughs> this is all Van. <laughs> okay. Whoa, 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 No, you said you wanted to I'm do interested. It, I'm interested. I'm just saying you brought it to my attention. I do find it quite interesting. Okay, let's do it. Okay, so this is the tweet. All right. There's, there's a back and forth between a man and a woman. I'll just give you the uh the entire rundown it was posted by the lady on Twitter. No names. Apparently, a man and a woman are going to go on a date. Mm -hmm. And they were going to go to a very nice restaurant. Mm -hmm. The man makes a reservation for the date. The woman sleeps through the reservation. She's, she's agreed to go out on the date. She, she falls asleep. She sleeps through the reservation. She's tie-woed. She's tuck-tuck tie-woed. She sleeps through the reservation. The man hits her and says, it was $70 to cancel the reservation last night. And then they have a back and forth. He says, it was $70 to cancel the reservation last night. It's not a big deal. I just thought you should know. That's all. Then she says, it is a big deal to you that's why you mentioned it at all he's he goes no that's a, just a fact it's the way the cookie crumbles it wouldn't have been right not to tell you she says you know what i can already tell we're not gonna click i don't like to sweat the small stuff he said if you say so okay then go ahead and zell venmo apple pay the 70 dollars and we don't have to sweat uh, i 
um, I would have offered to at least pay my portion because I'm a responsible adult. It's okay. You do you. Bye. She was like, if I was in your shoes, I wouldn't have brought up the $70, but we all wear different shoes. He says, how is that fair? She goes, do you really think life is fair? Because I have news. He goes, I didn't put, uh, I didn't, she, he goes, I didn't put a gun to your head and force you. She goes, it's not fair. You sound five. Sound like you're crying. <laughs> it's not fair for me to pay $70. <laughs> See? See? She would be my See? friend. Why? Okay. Is she, I wanna she's ask, like 100% wrong. I want to add some context to this. She okay. did oversleep. The date, according to her, the date was at 11 p.m. at night. She already had mm -hmm. kind of said, hey, it's late. I don't want to go. Or, or, you know, like it's going to be late for me. So she <laughs> fell asleep. But when she woke up, she apologized, okay? So the way it started off, it was just that he, the text that we saw was, hey, it was a Michelin star restaurant. Um, it was $70 to, to close, you know, to cancel the reservation. So, but before that, she apologized for oversleeping and explained why. And I guess his initial response was, it was a Michelin star restaurant. It was $70 to cancel. All right. Me. I think this, I'm sorry. This is extremely tacky on the guy. Okay. I get, oh, yes, Christ. I get that you may be upset. I, to be very honest, even back it up even further. If I knew I was going to a Michelin star restaurant and apparently I think she picked the restaurant or something like that. I'm not sure. But anyways, if I knew I was going to a Michelin star restaurant or any nice restaurant, when you have to cancel last minute or you miss, they always charge a fee. So I would know that. So me personally, I would have said, oh my God, I'm sorry I overslept. If there was a fee, let me know. That is what I would do, to be very honest with you. If he said, oh, it was $70 and still offered for me to pay, we got a problem. He should he should he shouldn't accept that even if I offered. He should just appreciate the fact that I gave that gesture. It is tacky on this man's part to tell to respond to her after she said she overslept and she's wrong and she apologized. She did the right thing by apologizing. For him to say, "Oh, by the way, you owe me $70," which is basically what he said. That's not cute. That's not attractive. And you got to let you got to just eat that up. If you're really interested in this woman, if you're Why? if you're really Why? interested in this woman, you reschedule the date and you see where it goes from there and like that kind of stuff, you just you laugh about it later. It's $70. You were going to a Michelin star restaurant, minimum $300. Minimum. What's $70 for you if you're really interested in establishing a relationship? Take the L and have another date. But he wanted to let her know. And to me, that lets me know everything I know about this man. He's petty. He is cheap. And was more interested in proving a point <laughs> than he was about getting to know this young lady. I'm not wrong. Okay. So... Uh, I don't know anything about this man. <laughs> I don't know anything about her. Sorry to this okay? man. She she put it on Twitter or else nobody would know. Mm -hmm. Okay. She put it on Twitter or else nobody would know. <laughs> um, I'm not about to make personal judgments about either one of them. I do. Because I don't know these people. But what I will tell you is that women have to decide how they want the world to be. Okay. And I, I just, This is I, not I, this. I, I'll just be honest with you. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Women have to decide how they want the world to be. Because if you, you, you guys can't cherry pick which parts of patriarchy that you like. That's not patriarchy to me. Uh, yeah, it is. Patri like, it, it, it is absolutely rooted in patriarchy that a man should have to like, like foot a financial burden. It's absolutely rooted this in This could have been two women it's in a relationship. And I still would have said, it's not rooted in patriarchy. It's not because he's a man. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on. Let's go back. Let, 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 let's go back and we'll go back. Let's like talk about what we we're talking about. Number one, if this was two women, she'd have never posted it because see, like, that's not this, true if necessarily. You, if, if this were two women, this doesn't even go anywhere. 
if this was two women, the only reason why, and, and another thing, I don't like the fact that we're not keeping it real. I am if this keeping were two it women, real. If, 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 if this were two women, this doesn't go anywhere. The only reason why this goes anywhere is because of the male-female dynamic that this has. The fact that a man is not supposed to say, hey, uh, the reservation got canceled. Could you pay me back the money? This is my thing. Would I have done this? No. And why? I'm not going to do this. Why? Because to me, because to me, there's a larger goal. Exactly. And because there's a larger goal. I know, but that doesn't mean that it's wrong to do. It's because I wouldn't do it. Like I was raised by a man, right? And when I'm raised by a man, the man says, hey, son, this is kind of what you take on when you go out with the woman. However, what I'm telling you is that if we're getting to a point to where we're decimating gender roles and nobody is talking about this and we're not doing any of this, somebody should be able to ask for their money back if 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 you guys had agreed to go somewhere and then you essentially flaked on them. Okay. Now, she might have been... T- she, oh, oh, let me tell you something real quick. Because, see, I let you talk. But, here, but here's the deal. He let me, y'all. I tell you... I, I tell you what, that's what everybody says that. Everybody says that. I, I let you talk. I let you talk. You let me talk. I I'll saw I was just watching you. Stephen A and Jalen. Yeah. So look, let me tell you something. You see if the roles were reversed here. If the roles were reversed here, and he had asked her out, mm-hmm. and she made a reservation because she wanted to go to a favorite restaurant, and he fell asleep. Mm-hmm. And he fell asleep. I mean, he fell asleep. Not hey. I can't go like this guy got ready. He did all of his stuff. He was whatever. And she fell asleep. And like she fell asleep. That's what happened. If he had done it and she went to Twitter going, I asked this guy for $70 because I put it. Y'all would be sister girling and this and the whole nine. And you're lying if you say any different. I'm sorry, man. We got to call it like it is. The reality is you don't want this guy to have been like, hey, you inconvenienced me, so can I have my money because you inconvenienced me because you want him to continue to work for you through an inconvenience. I would say that whoever makes the reservation is taking the lead. So if she made the reservation and he canceled, like you eat up the cost. You took the lead from the beginning. Doesn't matter man or woman. But if you do want me to keep it all the way real, I would expect for that man to say, I know. It, I would expect for him to say, <laughs> What? You think I'm stupid? I, I know. I like, would. You think I, you, like you, of, of course you would. I don't think that he necessarily should absolutely... have to. I don't think he should have to. I think she took the lead. Right. In, in your scenario, she took the lead. He shouldn't have to do that. But I kind of expect him to. Right, of course you do, because men, once again, uh, women are free to have all kinds of expectations of men, but men are not free to have any expectations of women. Because the moment that this, because this is about money, right? This is about money. So it's about money. Cool. The moment this guy says, hey, I took you out to dinner, so you should suck my dick. Now he's got a, now he is, uh, now he's a curmudgeon and a fucking chauvinist and all of that for adhering to something that's completely crazy. And I'm saying that it's completely crazy. So the the, the moment that he, the moment that it's okay if it's about money when it comes to a man, but it's not okay if it's about sex when it comes to a woman, it's not. And I, I get that these things are not the same. One is your body and one is what comes out of it. But what I'm telling you is traditionally these roles between men and women, and you'll even hear women say this, like, yeah, my man takes care of everything. That's why I do this and this and that for him. And that's why I do this and this and that for him. So I'm saying it's like, at some point, aren't we going to... Look, it's an. Ex, I guess it's a standard that everybody's acceptable, that everybody's accepted. But at some point, aren't we going to have to just stop intellectualizing this and just well, like, it's just about feelings? I also just... Yeah, it's about feelings, but also just because women say that there's a patriarchy or they want to be treated equally or they're independent women, doesn't mean that it erases gender roles completely. I I mean, like, I would be lying if I didn't say they exist. Like, it doesn't mean that you gotta be like, okay, well now you gotta do all this and you gotta do this. It's a partnership and it's give and take. But 
To me, it's not just money. It's also about taking the lead, which is why I said if a woman made the reservations and she put down her money, she has decided to take the lead in this scenario. And so it's like that. And the other person is following that lead. I don't know. It's complicated. But I also just don't believe in 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 that truly that exists where you can say gender roles are completely erased in this society. It's just well, this is what some I'm, of it this, is this is what I'm saying. Us. Well, this, uh, uh, see, so this is what I'm saying. What there can't be is gender roles when you want them to be. See, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying I'm not saying. Hold on, I'm not saying that like. Everybody live their life the way you want to live it. If you want to live a life where you're in a house and you're adhering to the gender roles and everybody is doing what that I work, so you take care of the babies and you whatever, all of that stuff, hey, whatever works for you is cool. What I'm saying is what I don't like is when it's gender roles when it works for you. Like gender roles, gender roles when it works for you means... I have to pay, okay? I have to pay, and that's fine. I don't, to me, I don't have to pay. To me, you know why I like to pay for everything? Not just with women, but with my friends. It's because it gives me control. Uh, yeah, I agree. <laughs> I, I, I ask for the check when I want the check, so I, I can leave when I want. I agree. I can, like, it just, it gives me control. I just, <laughs> control. Yeah. I like to control situations, so that's why I, I pay for things, right? Um, But what I'm saying is, it can't be, it just it, it, it to me if i'm being all the way honest it it makes it seem unserious and that's the part of it i think eliminating gender roles and the equality and the independence of women is a very serious issue it makes it look unserious to me when people go yeah but i still need you to do this because this works for me it makes it seem like you it, like there's no real basis for it. I don't think most women want to eliminate gender roles. Let me just be very clear about that. I don't think that most women are saying let's eliminate it. What I think when you talk about the patriarchy, it's about respect. Yes, it's about equal pay, but that's not the same thing as gender roles. That's just equality. And I think that sometimes we we confuse the two. Anyways, save it for the summit. Save, save it for, it for the, the summit. summit. We'll we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk about it at the summit. Look, hey, she said fuck him. It's cool. He said whatever. But he's not wrong for asking for the money. Like, yo, like we some adults. I wouldn't have done it. I'd have charged it to the game. I'd, I'd have made a whole joke about it. Like well, the next time we go out, I'm like, just to let you, hey, I probably wouldn't have, I probably wouldn't have brought it up. Yeah. I probably wouldn't have ever brought it up, you know, because it's like only $70. But if I would have brought it up, I'd have brought it up in a funny way to tease her for because I still have a goal, and my goal, <laughs> so so my goal is mission accomplishment. <laughs> so, and just to be so, and just to be clear, you said seventy dollars so, is not a lot. It's not that it's not. It's that they were going to a Michelin star restaurant. So in the grand scheme of that, seventy dollars is not a lot. You were on deck to yeah, pay hundreds all, and hundreds of dollars. Not all Michelin star restaurants cost that much money. Well, to be clear, she said if he had taken her to the Michelin star restaurant, she would have racked up five hundred dollars. <laughs> see, and so all right, let's get out of here, man. See y'all, but see y'all got okay, Rachel. Okay, I can't wait to the summit. Before I can't wait, wait to the summit. Before we go and you close it out, I just want to give a shout out. We shit on Texas. We talk about all the things that they're doing, but my homeboy is running for U.S. Congress, Justin A. Moore. He's, we're going to have him on this podcast. He's absolutely fantastic. He's a civil rights attorney. He's dedicated his life to the cause. I never thought he would run for politics, but it shows that we are in a situation in Texas and in this country where we need people like Justin Moore running for Congress. You can find out what he's about and what he represents at moreforTexas.com. That's M-O-O-R-E, the number four, Texas.com. Go on there, check it out. Even if you don't live in Texas, Texas is a battleground state and I, I, I think we need to flip it. So go on there, see what he's about and then support him. All right, do that. Do that. Justin A. Moore. A. Moore. He's A. Moral. No, I'm just sure. <laughs> go, go vote for him. He's great. Uh, all right. Take Think Caps Open. Do not stop learning. I'm Van Lathan Jr. And I'm Rachel and Lindsay. Bye, guys. Oh, hold on. Oh, Wait. oh, oh. 
Oh, before we go, it looks like Taylor Swift and Matt Healy have called it quits. After the fact. Oh my God, Rachel. Jesus Christ, man. No, can you good just, for her. Good for you, her. What do you want me to do? Like, Sing her praises? He's been at, he's been doing other stuff. He's come out and said that everybody was overreacting. He stands by what he said. She had to let him go. This was looking real bad for Taylor. It, it, so, so you really feel like Taylor Swift had to break up with her boyfriend? First off, it was well documented that he was like this before. And she still had some type of romance with him. I'm not giving her a pat on the back because it was short lived. She just, she got, he got caught. It got put, it got put on the mainstream of how he, of how he is. Whatever. Good for Taylor. She's back on the market. Matt Healy, <laughs> fuck off. <laughs> Thank you, think Cam's about to stop learning. I am Van Lathan Jr. I'm Rachel Ann Lindsay. Bye guys.